We will now hear the case of the International Military Tribunal versus Franz von Papen. The prosecution may now start their opening. Ladies, gentlemen, and justices of the tribunal, Franz von Papen is guilty of the charge of conspiracy. Von Papen gave Hitler totalitarian control of Germany, directly aided in the Anschluss, and broke the Treaty of Versailles. He was aware of all of Hitler's plans and supported him despite what the defense may tell you. Even though von Papen publicly acted as though he was against the Nazis, his private actions were the complete opposite. Von Papen did everything in his power to aid and strengthen the Reich. After von Papen's resignation as chancellor, he continued to meet with President von Hindenburg. Von Papen convinced the president to form a new government which included Hitler as chancellor and him as vice chancellor. Despite President von Hindenburg previously vowing he would never elect Hitler, von Papen was still able to convince the president to do otherwise. Once von Papen helped Hitler become chancellor, von Papen helped create and sign the enabling laws which suspended civil liberties and gave the Reich the government the to pass laws without approval of the parliament. By passing this law, von Papen gave the Reich government an overwhelming amount of power over the German people. Additionally, von Papen was a member of the parliament which formally outlawed all other political parties besides the Nazis. Without opposition, they had complete control. Finally, after the death of President von Hindenburg, von Papen signed the decree merging the presidency and the chancellery, making Hitler Fuhrer, officially giving Hitler totalitarian control of Germany. As Hitler states in document 2995-PS, Franz von Papen was the sole reason he was given power. Von Papen continued to support and help Hitler in his pursuit of power, and von Papen eventually handed over full totalitarian control of Germany to Hitler. Throughout the process, von Papen was never pressured. He was the one who gave Hitler power, therefore Hitler would not have been able to threaten von Papen because Hitler had no prior power prior to von Papen giving it to him. Furthermore, Von Papen made his decisions on his own accord and was well aware of Hitler's plans due to Von Papen being a high commanding Nazi and Hitler making all of his views extremely public. The defense will say he was pressured into doing all of his actions, which is false. Yes, in June of 1934, Von Papen made the Marburg speech where he publicly spoke out against the Nazis. After this, he was put on house arrest for a couple of weeks. The speech was von Papen throwing a temper tantrum over his lack of power, but in the preceding months, he went back to aiding the Nazis, making the speech hypocritical. Von Papen had supported everything the Nazis had done up until that point. He was simply upset that Hitler had more power than he did, so he lashed out in his speech. But after the speech, he continued to support and serve Hitler by choice. Von Papen had a warm, friendly relationship with Hitler as shown in the following and shown in the document 3357-PS, demonstrating how he was close allies with Hitler. Even though von Papen was upset about him losing some of his power to Hitler, which was his own fault, he was still an extremely powerful and influential aristocrat. He was never threatened by Hitler and remained allies with him. Von Papen continued to support, support and work with Hitler by choice after his speech, contradicting the entirety of the speech. My following point is that von Papen is guilty of aiding and allowing for the Anschluss in hopes of uniting all those who were considered racial Germans despite Austria's wishes to remain independent. After von Papen's time as vice chancellor, where he gave Hitler totalitarian control of Germany, he took upon the role of German ambassador of Vienna from 1933 to 1934. Von Papen's mission as German ambassador of Vienna was to weaken the Austrian government and allow for the Anschluss. He used his strong Catholic reputation and negotiated with the Austrian government on behalf of the Reich, further weakening Austria's government. Additionally, von Papen conducted negotiations to restore friendly relations between Austria, German and Austria and for Austria to become a state of Germany. He was recorded threatening the Austrian foreign minister in regards to Austria's independence. Von Papen also maintained contact and colluded with illegal Austrian Nazis whose goal was to annex Austria by any means necessary. 
In letter correspondence with Hitler, von Papen states that Austria must be part of the Reich for it to succeed. Document 2248-PS. From this, one can clearly see von Papen's goal was to make Austria part of the German Reich. From the beginning, von Papen knew his mission as German ambassador of Vienna was to annex Austria. He worked tirelessly to set up Austria for annexation. After von Papen's with meeting with American minister, George S. Messersmith, Messersmith plainly states, and I quote, the whole basic effort of von Papen was to bring about the Anschluss. Document 1760-PS. My preceding point is that von Papen plainly ignored and went against the Treaty of Versailles. The German public and von Papen were well aware of Hitler's missions of overthrowing the Treaty of Versailles due to it being one of Hitler's main campaigning promises. Von Papen had, had Hitler's complete and utter trust as stated in the letter to Papen in document 2799-PS. Therefore, he was aware of all of Hitler's plans of breaking the treaty, yet still gave him power. Von Papen also broke the treaty in Versailles himself by directly aiding the Anschluss, even though the treaty specifies how Austria must keep its independence as stated in Article 80. The defendant, Franz von Papen, will attempt to paint himself as an unknowing bystander to Hitler who was forced to do whatever was asked of him. This is simply untrue. Von Papen happily gave Hitler power and supported him. Otherwise, why would, have, why would von Papen have tried so desperately to get Hitler elected? Von Papen even considered, Hitler even considered von Papen to be a close friend. If someone is a close friend, one would believe they're open with each other or not feel threatened by one another, being why von Papen never felt pressured. Von Papen had full knowledge of all of Hitler's goals, including the ones he had for the Jews, due to, Hitler, due to him having Hitler's full and unlimited trust. Von Papen handed over to power Hitler, power, von Papen handed power over to Hitler while being aware of Hitler's plans to annihilate the Jews. He was also part of the cabinet which made statewide policies to persecute Jews. Yes, in von Papen's time as ambassador of Turkey, he led a couple thousand Jews into the country, but that does not make up for the millions of Jews he slaughtered by giving Hitler power. He may not have given orders to, of prosecuting Jews, but he was the reason the Nazis were able to murder millions. Von Papen was well aware of Hitler's plans for the Jews, yet still allowed Hitler to take power, making von Papen an accomplice. In conclusion, Von Papen is guilty of the charge of conspiracy. He gave Hitler totalitarian control of Germany, broke the Treaty of Versailles, and worked to allow for the Anschluss. He may have appeared to be against the Nazis to the public, but it was a lie. Von Papen believed in the Nazis and was a Nazi himself. He was a person in power and acted on his own accord. He was never pressured nor forced to act against his will, and each decision was his own. He knew what his actions entail and was completely aware of Hitler and the Nazis' plans, yet still chose to support them. Von Papen was an enabler for all of the Nazis' future actions because he was the one who gave Hitler the power. Your honors, you state in the 2020 chart of the tribunal, and I quote, instigators and accomplices participating in the formulation or execution of common plan or conspiracy to commit any of the foregoing crimes are responsible for acts performed by any person in execution of such plan. If you do intend to abide by your word, then it is obvious that Franz von Papen is accountable for all of Hitler's actions and for act annexing Austria despite their wishes, making von Papen guilty. Furthermore, Franz von Papen is guilty of the charge of conspiracy. Thank you. Thank you, prosecution. The defense may now begin their opening. Your honors, Franz von Papen is innocent of the charge of conspiracy levied against him by the prosecution. Franz von Papen acted for the good of the German nation, not the Nazi party in the period leading up to and during the Second World War. He was opposed to the Nazi party and their ideology. Any involvement he had with the Nazi party was purely out of necessity and for von Papen's personal well-being. Von Papen clearly states his opposition to the Nazi party before the Second World War. As seen in document number Papen-94, von Papen, who was the then Vice Chancellor of Germany, gave a speech at Marburg on 17 June 1934, denouncing the Nazi party and their totalitarian regime. Von Papen states, quote, the Nazi party suppresses that pillar of the, of the state 
which always, and not only in liberal times, was called justice. Their attacks are directed against the security and freedom of the private sphere of life, which the German people has won in centuries of hard struggle. As a result of the speech, he was arrested and confined to his house on the nights between third, June, June 30th and July 2nd, during which Hitler purged his political adversaries. These included von Papen's secretary, whom he had worked with when writing the Marburg speech. Hitler sent a message to von Papen that he could no longer step out of line or he would face the same fate as his colleague. From that point forward, von Papen did what little he could to hinder Nazi plans, as seen in document number Papen-94, an affidavit from Baron von Lerzner. Von Lerzner states that von Papen only remained in the Nazi party out of necessity, not only to keep himself alive, but also to be a, quote, hindrance to Nazi activities, end quote. Von Papen achieved his goals of slowing the Nazi juggernaut, first through his actions as ambassador to Vienna, then to Ankara. Those actions will be discussed later in the speech. Von Papen's decision to aid Hitler in his attempt to become chancellor was not a criminal offense. It is not a crime to aid another person in their ascent to power. Von Papen's actions were driven by a desire to save Germany from its then crisis. Von Papen thought that the appointment of Hitler would be the best for the German nation. He thought that he could control Hitler and shift him away from his Nazi beliefs while instructing Hitler to implement policy that would be beneficial to Germany. As seen in document number Papen-88, an affidavit from Alfred Hugenberg, Hugenberg states that a group of members of Hitler's cabinet, including von Papen, thought that it was imperative that Hitler's Nazi ideals should not be allowed to dominate the policy of the cabinet. However, the cabinet's attempt to sway Hitler from his Nazi stance failed, and, as previously stated, von Papen was forced to speak out against the Nazi party through public speaking, resulting in his imprisonment. If, after his imprisonment, von Papen did not comply with Hitler, he would have paid with his life. Von Papen knew that his effectiveness as a hindrance to the Nazi party would be greater if he was still alive. The prosecution may argue that Franz von Papen is guilty by association with Hitler, but at what point is guilt by association valid if disassociation means death? Von Papen's involvement in German relations with Austria was not a criminal involvement. As ambassador to Vienna, his goal was not the annexation of Austria, but rather to establish peaceful relations between Germany and Austria. After being released from prison, he was offered the position as ambassador to Vienna. As seen in an affidavit from Hungarian Admiral Miklos Horthy, document number Papen-76, von Papen was only willing to accept his role as ambassador to Vienna if he was assured by Hitler in writing that there was to be no violence used against Austria. As seen in a letter from Adolf Hitler, document number 2799-PS, von Papen's wishes were granted by Hitler, who assured him that there was to be no force used against the Austrians. Hitler's direct orders were for von Papen to establish peaceful channels between Austria and Germany. Von Papen helped structure a deal between Germany and Austria so that there could be peace between the two countries, as well as ensuring that Germany would recognize Austria's sovereignty. After which, he submitted his resignation to Hitler, as seen in document number Papen-71. Von Papen believed that he had achieved his goal of generating a peaceful relationship between the two countries and attempted to leave his post as ambassador. His resignation was denied by Hitler. After his resignation was denied, he worked to soothe the growing tensions between Austria and Germany. Von Papen arranged for the meeting between Adolf Hitler and Kurt, Kurt Schuschning, the Austrian chancellor, seen in document number Papen-78. This meeting established a close and friendly relationship between the two countries. Due to his policy of ensuring friendly relationships with the Austrians, however, von Papen became a target for many Nazis. In document number Papen-102, W. Redemacher von Una, a newspaper correspondent, states that von Papen would not, quote, be dissuaded from carrying out his mission as he himself did understand, to be a mediator and a peacemaker. This unwillingness to stray from the agreement he had made with the Austrians, combined with the general disliking of von Papen by many Nazis, led to von Papen's removal as ambassador. He was given the role of ambassador to Ankara. As ambassador to Ankara, von Papen saved the lives of 10,000 Jewish people who were meant to be deported from, to Poland from France for extermination. As seen in document number Pap, Papen-95, an affidavit from Professor Marcianini, Marcianini came to von Papen asking for help in saving the lives of, of 10,000 Jewish people. Marcianini states that, quote, Herr von Papen complied with my wish, and through his intervention, the lives of those Jews were saved. This show of good faith towards the Jewish people was extremely dangerous for von Papen, 
and serves as an example of von Papen's anti-Nazi beliefs. Had von Papen not retained his place in the Nazi party by feigning allegiance to Hitler's cause, those Jewish people would have died. This show of Jewish empathy was not exclusive. The, doc the contents of document number Papen-35 explained that before the Second World War, the von Papen government inscribed, quote, protection of Jews on its governmental banner in a show of solidarity with the Jewish people. This evidence confirms that Hitler's policy of complete anti-Semitism was not shared by von Papen. In summary, Hitler's Nazi policies were not the same as von Papen's personal policies. Von Papen, had, von Papen had Germany's best interest in mind at all times. His association with the Nazi party was only out of necessity. And even while associated with Hitler, von Papen worked to undermine the Nazi party. Franz von Papen is not guilty of the charge of conspiracy. Thank you, defense. The defendant may now make their statement. Your honors, I, Franz von Papen, am here today to plead my innocence to the charges of conspiracy. I will provide you a view into the historical environment from the beginning of my career in politics until the end of the war. After returning home from England in 1919, I found my home, my country, my people in utter distress. I was left in a state of shock after witnessing the piling economic, social, and political difficulties of my home. I knew my responsibility as a German citizen and couldn't bear the thought of standing on the sidelines. For doing nothing to help her, my dearest country, was not an option. My love for her and her people was the only factor in all my actions. My every step was in faith. Christianity was something that guided me. I grew up with Christian principles. Faith was something that maintained Europe's connections and peace. It brought about an international communi community that I was so glad to be a part of. My time after my chancellorship was difficult. I decided to accept a prominent position as vice chancellor under Hitler, for I considered it my duty to help steer national socialism into responsible channels. Their radical ideologies posed a threat to the Christian foundations of Germany. I consistently put forth the utmost amount of effort into guarding those foundations. Clearly, I underestimated the opposing evil. Germany was driven into a catastrophe and I was in a powerless position. Looking back, I see Hindenburg's and my ignorance in believing we were capable of con controlling such a tyrant. No one, including myself, though I tried, could control Hitler. I'm a man not afraid to speak my mind, though I lost my freedom on June 17, 1934, when I delivered my Marburg speech. I publicly spoke on how treacherous and detrimental the Nazi party's radical excesses were the dangers they posed to the state. Without a doubt, it wasn't allowed to get printed in the press and Hitler was furious. My advisors who drafted the speech were killed two weeks later. It was not only my last speech I gave publicly against national socialism, it was Germany's last. I resigned from my position as vice chancellor for if I could not open my mouth freely, what was I doing in that position? I was then offered the post of minister to Austria, and at first I refused, only accepting when Hitler declared to me in writing that no violence would be used. I was there to establish a friendly relationship of friendly channels with our neighboring state. I do not locate any guilt where the prosecution claims to have found it. And I asked the tribunal to acknowledge the historic truth behind these accusations, for my actions only had sincere intent intentions. I'm solely a man of my country, of my faith, and of my people. Thank you, defendant. The direct examination may now begin. The prosecution alleges that as ambassador to Vienna, your goal was annexation. What was your true mission as ambassador to Vienna? I was ambassador of Vienna from 1934 to 1938. My task there was to put Austria and Germany back into normal and friendly channels and rekindle our once prospering relationship. And that's exactly what I did. I completed my tasks on July 11th, 1936 when the Austrian policy peace treaty restored relations between Germany and Austria. In regard to my acceptance in this, into this position, I first refused. 
only to accept when Hitler declared to me in writing that no violence would be used. Why was the Marburg speech your last public speech against the Nazis? The Marburg speech I gave on June 17th, 1934 was in fact the last speech I had made against National Socialism. I knew this speech denouncing the radical actions of the Nazi party would not be well recepted with Hitler. Hitler. Nevertheless, I gave it anyway. Hitler was furious as expected and I didn't let that stop me from speaking on how treacherous and detrimental the Nazi party's radical action, ex radical, radical excesses were, the dangers they posed to the state. Um, it was my last speech I gave publicly as I resigned from my position as vice chancellor um, uh, three days later after my colleagues were killed on the night of the, the on the night of the long knives. Everything changed after that, and I could have easily just been next. I couldn't let that happen because I was solely not fighting for myself. I was fighting for the people I had to protect. What activities did you do as ambassador to Ankara regarding the Jewish question? Um, in, 18, or, or in April of 1939, I became ambassador to Ankara. Um, regarding the Jewish question, I was able to save 10,000 Jews from deportation. I fought the measures of the German government, refusing to take a pa the passports away from those Jews in Turkey as it would strip them of their rightful citizenship. My determination to help Germany and her people never ceased. I had refused this position twice because of the recent occupation of Albania by Italy and the fact that this position had been vacant for six months, but I'm so glad I did accept this position as I was able to save those Jews. As a member of Hitler's cabinet, what were your thoughts on his Nazi policies? I feared um, Hitler's Nazi policies would consume the cabinet and I was determined not to let that happen. Their radical dictatorial dispositions posed a threat and I thought the, ma the maintenance of Christian principles would be the best counterweight. These were by no new feelings for me as ever since September of 1923, when I first published um, a pamphlet, I have felt the same way. How did your values as a Catholic impact your decisions as Vice Chancellor and Ambassador to Vienna and Ankara? My values as a faithful, faith, faithful Catholic man impacted every decision I made in my lifetime. It drove my morality. Every action has, I've taken has been under God. It has driven my capacity to keep fighting and working through some of the toughest times in my life. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't be the man who I am today without it. Why did you attempt to resign from your post as ambassador to Vienna in 1936? I attempted to resign from my post as ambassador to Vienna in 1936 after the Austri Austrian policy peace treaty restored relations between Germany and Austria. My tasks were finished and I had done what I went there to do. Unfortunately, I wasn't granted leave and I had to stay in that position for another two years. In document number Papen-94, Baron von Lerzner indicates that there was a group within Hitler's cabinet who did not wish to see the cabinet fall under, under Nazi policy. Can you explain this group? This group consist, consisted of myself and other like-minded individuals who were against Nazi policy. We cherished the Christian and conservative foundations of Germany and didn't support Hitler's radical excesses. We thought we could control Hitler, steering away from his political radicalism, guiding it into responsible channels. Thank you. Thank you, defense and defendant. The cross-examination may now begin. Were you a part of the Nazi party? Yes or no, please. I was associated with the Nazi party. Yes. Were, yes, you were a part of the Nazi party. There you go. Um, did you support Hitler because you believed in his policies or else why would you have tried so desperately to get President von Hindenburg to elect Hitler as Chancellor? 
I did not support Hitler's policies. I tried so desperately to get- And why did you try and get President von Hindenburg to elect yes, him? Getting to that. Because after my own chancellorship in Germany, I realized that Germany's state of being was nothing, it was in a catastrophe. Please answer the question. I had been in, I had been in a position trying to fix Germany, trying to get it back to where it should be. And it seemed me and my colleagues only believed that Hitler may have been the way to go. He was, um, it's not that I supported his beliefs or policy at, at all, but he was kind of our only option at that point. And I was going to be under him as vice chancellor, supporting and steering away because we knew he had these radical, crazy actions that I in no way supported, but I Are had the plan to- my question? So you tried to get him elected, even though there's many other options, but you did not support him, even though you desperately tried to convince, even though President von Hindenburg did not want him as chancellor, you convinced him to do otherwise. I, I supported a politician and that is not illegal. It's no crime to- okay, So you did support so I supported him as, I did not support his policy. I did not support, but me, me convincing him, I'm not finished. Me, I, me- Sign the enabling act. When, what are you referring to? What year, if I may ask? The enabling act document um, let me check. Does it matter what year it was? Did you sign it? Yes or no? Because you, it has it your signature. It does matter because what are you referring to? I can. Um, okay, Michael's about to sign it. Okay, proceeding question. Did you sign the decree merging the chancellery and um, the presidency giving Hitler totalitarian control of Germany? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you recall saying you, moving on to your role, were you the um, German ambassador of Vienna? Yes or no? Yes. Do you recall saying you have your, to the, um, uh, Austrian foreign minister, do you recall saying you have your French and English friends now and you can have your independence a little longer as a threat and document 1760-PS. What did you mean by this if not to take away their independence? Um, you said document 1760-PS. 1760-PS. Um, can you rephrase the, rephrase the question please? Do you recall threatening the Austrian foreign minister by saying you have your French and English friends now and you can have your independence a little longer, if not to mean to take away Austria's independence in the near future? No, not threatening and not to take away Austrians' independence in the near future. Then what did you mean? I, it's simple political talk. Okay. And my proceeding question is, what did you mean when you said the Third Reich will be part, will be with Austria or not at all? Document 2248-PS. Did you mean that you wanted to annex Austria? This was in a letter um, correspondence with Hitler. Of course not. This is only in regard to the relations that we want to restore with Austria. Austria was- By having uh, it as part of the Reich? and annexing it? Not annexing it. I was promised that no violence would be used. My sole goal there was... Um, were you aware of Hitler's plans to break the Treaty of Versailles? No. Even though he made countless speeches to the entirety of Germany, did you just not listen? Did you not hear it? Even the though- promise. I made a promise that my role there had nothing, no violence would be used. The only reason I went and agreed as this position, I had refused it twice. I the only reason I- where one, second, I one second, I just need to finish the thought and you can ask your question, question right after. My question was, reason, were you- were you aware of Hitler's plans to break the Treaty of Versailles? Sorry, prosecution, time is up. I will now yield my position as presiding 
justice to Justice Hubbard for the questioning by the tribunal. A question for the defense. You supported Hitler's rise to power. Do you have any regrets or feel any remorse for what happened due to your signing of the and giving Hitler full control? I had no idea what was to come. I honestly couldn't have expected what happened after that. He was, he seemed as it was our only option. He was going to help bring Germany out of the state that we were in. And we had so many social and economic issues. We were drowned in debt. And I, I had no idea what was to come. So I, I couldn't tell at that moment, I had no idea of what it would lead that I do know now. So now, do you feel any remorse for it, now that you knew what happened? Um, I don't feel guilt in, uh, because I, I didn't know what was going to happen, so I can't say how I would feel, because I, could, I couldn't foresee the outcomes that would come after that. So unfortunately, I can't give you an answer. The prosecution, this is again for the defense, but the prosecution spoke that, and you did too, about how if you spoke out again, again against the Nazis, your life would most likely be taken as well. Do you believe that your life is more important than the lives that the millions of Jews died, um, died that um, after you gave Hitler control? Of course not. But I was fighting for... German lives. I was fighting for Jews in Germany. I was fighting for Jews in Turkey. That it's not that I valued my own life because of course not, but it was the fact that I was doing so much and trying so hard and battling and trying to suppress and uh, control and steer national socialism and the Nazi policy away from what it was becoming. And if I wasn't there to do that, I, don't, I didn't know who else would. Can you elaborate on your house arrest on the night of the Long Knives? Um, well, after my office was ransacked and my, uh, my former colleagues that helped me wrote the Marburg speech were um, killed, I was just stuck in my house, not leaving, not doing anything. I was, fe I feared for my life. Cause if, you, if anyone saw all the people that they saw every day worked with get murdered on the night of the long knives, it, it was just frightening. Would you view the fact that you were not killed as a sign of good faith by Hitler? I think it was more as a warning, um, not, a. Uh, well, yes, he has, he felt that I was a person, but I think it was a warning towards me to say like that I'm next or that I will be next. It was more of a threat to keep me alive. Did you receive any like written or verbal confirmation of like this warning? Of, um, not in any of the evidence document in, in the document books. Do you feel your morals guided your decisions in the um, in the way you contributed to the Nazi party? Mm, my contributions to the Nazi party, could you um, be more specific or? Yes, when you made, uh, when you allowed Hitler to rise to power or even when you had your position as uh, minister, no, ambassador to Austria. Um, definitely. I am a man of Catholic faith, as I have said several times today, and it, it affects my morals. It is my morals. I work under God. God is who I work under. It has driven me and defined my morals and what I see is right and wrong. So, of course, I would not agree to Nazi policy. And during my time in Vienna, just doing my job as I was given, trying to establish a relationship, a friendly relationship with a neighboring country that we needed to rekindle, it definitely guided my morals. Um, you say you're not fighting for yourself, but for the people. 
and yet you quit speaking out when you feel threatened. Um, what are your thoughts on that contradicting statement? Well, I quit speaking out publicly. Um, the, my Marburg speech was the last public speech I made to, to Germany. It was also the last speech anyone made to Germany against national socialism on such a public scale. And it was not that I stopped speaking about it because of course I didn't, but it obviously wasn't public, publicly documented, but I wouldn't find it contradicting because my associates, my associates lost their life after pulling quote unquote, a stunt like that. So it was not that I was, it's not contradicting my beliefs. Um, it was that I just wanted to keep, stay alive so I could keep doing what I was doing under the radar and under the radar a little bit. Do you have evidence of private speaking outs against the Nazi party? Unfortunately, not in the document ebook. Thank you, defendant. The time for tribunal questioning is over and the prosecution may now begin their closing. Thank you. Ladies, gentlemen, and justice of the tribunal. I hope you can now see that defendant Franz von Papen is guilty of the count of conspiracy. He gave Hitler totalitarian control of Germany, directly aided in the Anschluss, and broke the Treaty of Versailles. Von Papen was the one who gave Hitler in the power in the first place, proceeded to sign the law, um, laws merging the presidency and the chancery, giving Hitler complete power over Germany, as the defendant admits. He also says he does not feel guilty of allowing Hitler to take power, even though that meant Hitler murdered millions of people. The defendant, if the defendant's all about having moral grounds, then how does he not, how can he possibly not feel guilty for murdering millions if he did not support Hitler's plans of annihilating the Jews? The defendant also admits he was a part of the Nazi party. And if he's a Nazi part of, he was a part of the Nazi party, then what wouldn't he have supported the Nazis' policies? He keeps saying how he wasn't approving of them, but yet he still still was a part of it. And then in your questioning, the um, your honors, you point out there's no evidence of him privately speaking out against the Nazis besides the Marburg speech. That was his one time of speaking against the Nazis, which was simply him being upset. There was nothing else and he was not murdered. Hitler could have very easily killed him right then and there, but von Papen knew that was not gonna happen because von Papen was a powerful aristocrat and Hitler would not have done that to him because they were friends. Von Papen never felt pressured nor was forced into doing any of his actions. Later, von Papen continued to support Hitler in annexing Austria. He, as ambassador of Vienna, von Papen conducted negotiations restoring friendly relations between the countries and for Austria to regard herself as a state of Germany. The American minister even states how von Papen's sole purpose was to, for Germany's, um, as a German ambassador of Vienna, was for von Papen to bring about the Anschluss. This, von Papen's goal was to obviously annex Austria. He, in, um, after the questions about his threat to the Austrian foreign minister, he says it was not a threat just to rejoin the countries in friendly relations, but it was. If his sole goal was to annex Austria, what else would his threat have been? He was also had Hitler's unlimited trust, meaning that if he had someone in his unlimited trust, he would have known Hitler's goal of annexing Austria as well. And it also, he keeps saying of how it was meant to be peaceful. It does not matter if it's peaceful, it's still breaking the Treaty of Versailles to annex Austria, and Austria still did not want to be part of the German Reich. Von Papen also broke the treaty by assisting in the annexation of Austria and by giving Hitler power despite knowing his plans to break the treaty. The entire German public knew about uh, Hitler's plans of breaking the treaty. So how would Papen have not known as well? That makes absolutely no sense for the defendant to have no idea of that and being such a high ranking Nazi. So that does not add up. Your honors, I hope you abide by the 2020 charters of the tribunal and see that the evidence I've presented to you that von Papen is clearly guilty. 
In conclusion, I hope that you can see that von Papp is guilty of the charge of conspiracy for being an enable of all of Hitler's actions and the Nazis' future actions, allowing for the onslaught and finally breaking the Treaty of Versailles. Thank you for your time, and I hope you make the right decisions in your proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, prosecution. The defense may now begin their closing. Your honors, I hope you can see from the previous trial that Franz von Papen is not guilty of the charge of conspiracy. The prosecution has argued that Franz von Papen was entirely knowing of Adolf Hitler's plans to annex Austria and his totalitarian control or in gain to totalitarian control of Germany. It is clear from the from the defendants from the defendants uh, responses to my to my questions that the defendant did not wish to see Germany fall under Nazi policy. The defendant always had Germany's best interests in mind. The prosecution says that or or says that um Adolf Hitler placed his full trust in von Papen in the the annexation of Austria, but the the defense, I mean, sorry, the prosecution misuses this evidence. The evidence is <clears throat> document number PS-2799 uh, or 2799-PS. In this evidence, the prosecution tries to say that uh, it's it's clear that Adolf Hitler makes his goal, uh, makes it or makes it clear that he wishes um, for von Papen to annex Austria. However, in this letter, Hitler is stating that von Papen's sole mission to Austria is to establish friendly and peaceful channels. Von Papen achieves this by allowing or by making it so Germany recognizes Austria's sovereignty as a nation. Are these the actions of a man who wishes to for Germany to annex Austria? No. The defendant also states that his Catholic values drove many of his decisions. His morals drove drove his decision as ambassador of Ankara, as seen in this trial, to save the 10,000 Jewish people. The prosecution also argues that, um, sorry, if von Papen truly stuck by these morals, he would have sp stuck, spoke out again after the Marburg speech. However, how can one speak out if it would result in death? What effect can von pa could von Papen have had on the Nazi party and on the Second World War if he was dead? He could have had no effect. Von Papen's actions in not speaking out were actually heroic. He saved many, many, many lives in his through his actions. Justices, it is clear that Franz von Papen is not is not guilty of the charge of conspiracy. Thank you, defense. This now concludes our trial.